and multinationals are one vehicle um, for providing productivity. Uh, the increase in productivity by promoting technology and capital transfer to these poorer countries, which may not have been able to bring in these technology necessary uh, for this increased produ productivity on it, their own. Uh, sorry, I got a little tongue tied there at the end. Uh, also, I think it's worth saying that it's probably unfair uh, to blame every uh, example of an unfortunate consequence in a developing nation on the involvement of the multinationals in that country. And also that I think it's maybe a little bit unfair to uh, label or to, to disparage every uh, corporation involved in uh, the production of goods for our armed forces as a member of the uh, military industrial complex as a use to write off uh, the, the good things that it has done. Uh, so that's all I have to say. I would like to make responses to two of the claims that the other team made. Um, the first is a response to large firms seeking tax havens. The U.S. corporate tax rate is currently the second highest in the world behind Japan. It is due to these very high tax rates that large firms hire lobbyists in order to uh, work to receive the tax breaks for their respective firms. The solution to this is to reform our corporate tax policies. We need to decrease the corporate tax rate in order to bring it closer in line with the rest of the world and make changes to the ability of firms to get these tax breaks. That is, local and federal governments need to stop bending to the will of big business when they say that they will leave if they don't receive the tax breaks, because it is quite likely that the firm would not, in fact, leave the country if they had to pay higher taxes. For example, when governments talk about imposing environmental regulations, many companies threaten to leave the country and move to a country that has less stringent environmental regulation. However, there have been studies that have found that, those, that when those environmental regulations are imposed, the firms do not, in fact, leave. So the solution to that is really for the governments to start calling the bluff of these large firms when they say that they're going to leave. And then the second point that I want to respond to is social welfare being held hostage by corporate welfare. As we stated earlier, the social responsibility of a business in is to increase its own profits. And an incorporated firm cannot do anything if that action will limit the profitability for its shareholders. However, investing in social endeavors can be beneficial to a firm's bottom line. That is, firms pursue programs of social welfare in order to bolster their revenue by using corporate social responsibility as a marketing ploy, which may seem shallow, but it reaches the same end. One of the benefits of large firms pursuing social welfare is the scale in which they can implement their plans. In 2004, an activist at a coalition meeting of 54 environmental and social advocacy groups remarked that, quote, a small movement by Walmart would have huge ripple effects, end quote. The same holds true for any large corporation. If a large firm makes even a small change to help stop overfishing or sweatshop labor or any other perceived ill of big companies, it can make large changes across the market. It is not necessarily a bad thing that firms use these topics as a marketing ploy because it means that socially responsible things get done by these large companies. For example, going back to Walmart, uh, Walmart is buying social and, no, solar and wind power in Mexico. The percentage of their energy consumption that comes from these renewable energy sources is very small, but according to Walmart's 2010 Global Sustainability Report, their emissions per $1 million of sales are falling. And this is real change, and it's being done by these large firms that have the resources available to pay the higher upfront costs of making these eco-friendly business decisions. So as long as society wants the social welfare to be upheld, and as long as shoppers show their approval of large firms pursuing these socially responsible policies by going to the stores and purchasing their merchandise in greater numbers, social welfare is actually being promoted and powered by corporate welfare. 
Thank you. So I guess now we'll do some questions from the judges. If you have questions for particular uh, debaters that you would like them to address. We're going to go up here so that our voices can be heard on yeah. the mic. Hello. Uh, so for the small business team, I wanted to ask the following. Small businesses are very focused on the customer and their product. At least in my experience, the last thing they want to do is invest in support services for employees. So in the idea of social welfare, my question is, if we have a lot of small firms trying to maximize profits, what's going to protect the workers from exploitation by the managers who are also the owners, who may not even in fact have a human resource department, who may in fact not have standard labor practices, who may in fact not have a lawyer who's warning them about Fair Labor Standards Act uh, regulations and those kinds of things. Thank you. I guess I can try to respond to that. Um, so the question was focusing on customers and product as opposed to focusing on support services and that sort of thing, and like workers' rights being right. sort of trampled. All right, so um, at least in terms of workers' rights, there's obviously, I can I, I'm just not gonna really talk about the fact that large businesses don't exactly look at workers' rights uh, that much either. Um, uh, I guess there are definitely standard labor practices that are, to a certain extent, um, that can be sort of trampled over, but um, as the philosophers Senate and Cobb have spoken on, uh, they wrote um, a paper on the divided self, which talks about um, managers um, working against uh, the interests of humans and in doing so creating a system in which um, there's a divided self, there's a work self in which you're looked down upon, and then there's a home self in which you are like an actual human being and you treat yourself as a, as a human being. And um, small firms, uh, as a result of their tight-knit communities and the fact that there's a smaller number of employees in these firms are able to develop much more uh, in-depth interpersonal relationships. And as a result of this, um, there is usually a lot less incentive and a lot less um, desire by uh, managers of smaller firms to do the sort of things that will hurt um, their workers and hurt their employees uh, because they know them personally. They've spent years working with them. Maybe they both went up through the company together. Maybe they both um, even started the company together. Um, does that answer it? Right. Uh, well, my question for the pro small business uh, team: uh, uh, Luke has insisted on the benefits of uh, clusters. Uh, one might rep one might reply that what you are proposing in the end is that several small firms may get together and work like a big firm. But uh, if that's the case. Uh, that would not be a, an argument against big firms because one might claim that you have more coordination problems uh, the more uh, actors, agents you have. So if one of the benefits uh, is uh, for clusters of several small firms, why not go to a big firm after all?
I believe the answer to your question can be found in what Daniel brought up about um, diseconomies of scale and in how in, um, and what also Luke was just talking about in hierarchies of big businesses and coordination and how managers then may have incentives to work towards bonuses and not actually what's in favor of the business or the workers. So citing off the Emilia um, Romagna region in Italy, which is a highly successful area, it's actually where Ferraris are made. They can make complex products on very small businesses and the benefit that they have then of coordinating with people who want to work towards a similar end goal while keeping their small, in-depth, interpersonal relationships. So they get the benefit of economies of scale while also avoiding the negative aspects of diseconomies of scale. <coughs> uh, let me say first that I've, uh, I've enjoyed this debate. You have raised many issues, uh, in fact so many that it's hard to know where to begin and, um, and how, to, how to address this. Um, but let me, let me start by saying that I was, I was uh, very pleased to hear both teams emphasize that, that um, in thinking about this we should, uh, we should look at a much broader notion of welfare than just sort of income or traditional, traditional economic measures. And both teams have, have raised some of these issues. Uh, for, for the against side, um, if I understood you correctly, you, you you saw one of some of the some of the main drawbacks of big business being that that it might be bad for democracy in some sense. You saw big business having undue influence on media, elections, health legislation, taxes, a whole range of issues. Um, and I guess I would like to ask not so much the the against team but the pro team whether whether you see any dangers of this kind um, and if so um, if there are ways that you would address them um, staying on this this broad issue of, of of welfare i understood you to say that that some of the big benefits you saw was that big business um, could um, go in and actually promote sort of sound values in developing countries, for instance, they could fight corruption or uh, stuff like that. And I guess I would like to ask you if, if you feel there's a lot of evidence um, on this, because I guess my feeling is that we have a number of cases where big businesses have actually been involved in corruption. Um, and I was just wondering how, how you, um, you, might, you might look at that. And then on, on, for, for both teams, still staying a little bit with these sort of welfare uh, measures. Um, I asked you for, for, for data maybe on, on, on corruption, but I think both teams could strengthen their case if they had a little bit of, of more concrete evidence. For instance, if you talk about, about how workers are doing in large and small companies, there must be evidence on what is what are average worker incomes in different companies, what are average benefits in different types of companies. And um, maybe I missed it, but I didn't hear a lot of, a lot of uh, direct evidence on that. There may also, going to your more soft sort of uh, values, there may be some evidence on worker satisfaction in different, in different types of enterprise. I'm wondering if you have any evidence of that kind. So this was all about your sort of broader, broader issues. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try and do that in the order where I remember it. My memory is terrible, so if I forget anything, please stop me. Uh, as far as seeing evidence of uh, troubles with d democracy in a uh, you know, due to big corporations, uh, I think we absolutely see that. But I also think that when it comes down to it, a lot of that has to do with um, the failure of us as a society and as voters and as uh, government officials to more strictly re regulate, to demand stricter regulation on these firms about what lobbyists can do. Not just uh, corporate lobbyists, but special interest group lobbyists and uh, and, and foreign government lobbyists and all of that. I think that there's uh, most of the perils of democracy from, from lobbying are, are not something um, that's exclusive to big business. 